part of those who are called. He tells us in verse 10, probably a familiar verse to many of us, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. In other words, he even, he even puts calling and election on the same plane. They're almost synonymous. They're not, but they're almost synonymous in this verse. They are absolute certainties. And he says, because it is such an absolute certainty, you need to be diligent to make sure that you are one of those called ones. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. As Paul would say, examine yourself to make certain that you are one of the called ones. Now we can't make ourselves a called one, but we can examine to make sure we have been, that the reality of that is present. That's, that means it is so sure that we can actually examine to make certain it is a reality in our lives. So people, as we look at that, then we begin to see that there's no doubt the way Peter uses this term. He uses this term, <coughs> excuse me, he uses this term in a manner not unlike the same way that Paul used it in Romans 8.30 where he tells us, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, glory, he glorified. So that we could just as easily say, those who are called are glorified. In other words, there's not a trickle down anywhere in that verse. There's not a, a slow leak or a slow loss along the way that you start out with one group that's predestined and by the time you get to the glorified, you've lost a few along the way. No. The whole point of Romans 8 is to establish that the ones that are predestined are glorified. There's no loss. The called is absolute certainty. It is effectual. So we could say then that those whom God has called are and will be blessed by God absolutely. And we receive God's blessing as kingdom children. This blessing that he has told us about in verse 9 is an absolute reality for the child of God. And I hope you'll understand why I'm taking the time to establish this once we get to looking back at why we are called to bless those that are still in this world, in this kingdom. Now, the next question is, what is this blessing of God that we have received? What is Peter referring to? What is it that he has in mind? Well, thankfully, we have it very well established for it, and I'm just going to give you Peter's summation of this blessing in the very beginning of his book. We don't have time to run all the way back through the other chapters and pick out all the individual parts of the blessing. But notice again what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. People, that's the blessing of God. The blessing of God is that so great a salvation that we have been blessed with. And all that it entails the privilege of knowing the king of the kingdom, the privilege of being a royal child, the privilege of being adopted into his royal family, the privilege of seeing and experiencing kingdom life, the privilege of knowing God intimately, and probably more importantly, him knowing us. People, that's the blessing of God. I think it's necessary that we get a grasp of this blessing because today 
there are so many very poor, very weak ideas about what a blessing of God entails. You know, I, I was listening to a, uh, a message the other day, uh, and uh, a pastor began to talk about the blessing of God in terms of being able to drive a Lexus. That, that, was, that was a blessing of God. You know, could drive a Lexus. A and that every Christian ought to be rich. Abraham was rich, and we're children of Abraham. And, uh, because we're children of Abraham, uh, you know, we ought to be rich too. It it's all about the temporal things that are going to burn. People, does God bless His children with temporal things, yeah, but is that what we're talking about when Peter's talking about us gaining a blessing? I hope not. My goodness, if that's all there is to it, I could just as easily get some of those blessings another way. And the world does. If that's all there is to it, what are we suffering for? Why is it so important if all we're looking for is the next gold ring that the world wants to throw up? Now, I'll be honest, people. If, if that's the idea that so, most people have of Christianity and the real worth of Christianity, I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't have anything of it. That's a sad, sad excuse for an idea of the blessing of God. No, the blessing I'm talking about, the blessing that I want, is the blessing that God has outlined for us here in 1 Peter and, of course, all over the Word of God. It's knowing Him. It's the privilege of being with Him. It's all those eternal things that He has blessed us with. I can't settle for anything else. That's the blessing of God. So as kingdom children then, I have totally lost my place. The effectual blessing of God is all that He is and does for us in Christ Jesus and is bestowed on all who are genuinely redeemed, which is itself part of the blessing. We've, we've got to, to get an understanding of the greatness of the blessing of God. To have anything else isn't worth having. So if we understand then this blessing, if we, if we know what this blessing is all about, now let's back up and begin to look at the calling, the, the, our responsibility while we are still here in this world. And I would tell you that Peter is telling us not only to remember the blessing, but to remember that because you are blessed, you are called to respond to others with a blessing. Now here is where us understanding this issue of the effectual nature of this blessing is going to be vitally important for us. I think Peter gives us two reasons that tie his command together. The reason why he uses the fact that we are blessed to give us the reasoning for blessing those that are still of this kingdom and this world. The first reason is this. We bless others at all times because God has effectually blessed us. Now, think about this in terms of the blessing, in terms of thinking of it in, as it being effectual in nature and not just potential. That it is an actual blessing, not a potential blessing. If it was simply a potential blessing, then Peter using the blessing of God as the reason why we bless others would break down. It would be something along this line. He would be saying, in essence, God has provided a potential blessing for you if you'll have it. Therefore, when those of the other kingdom treat you evilly and revile you, you must respond with a blessing. 